Sorry about the wait. I would like to introduce Rebecca, Julian, and Sergey, and you're gonna talk about weird machines in ABI and architecture metadata. And if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'll give you the microphone. Thank you. Hello. Great. Uh, sorry for the issues with these machines. We're going to show you machines that are uh, weirder than this, but a lot more fun. Uh, just to introduce us, we're from Dartmouth College, a small college in the northeast of the US, two hours north of Boston, if you happen to visit. Um, Rebecca and Julian are going to present their respective parts of research. Uh, I will start with an intro explaining what is it that we do and why we do it in this talk. So um, you may know the joke about the uh, earth being supported by an elephant and then there is a turtle and then what supports the turtle? No, it's the turtle is all the way down. So all the way, all the way down uh, you have rather complicated computing structures that uh, exist in your uh, platforms uh, from uh, your processor, from your runtime to your processor. And the, th the question is, uh, why study them? And the answer, uh, as we see it, is that what we do uh, is about trusting computers. And trusting computers is about what they can and cannot compute. If you are certain that your computer cannot compute something, well, then you are secure from it doing, not doing that to you. And uh, that's why we study uh, really weird computational models, and you'll see how it goes. So I will start with a disclaimer. We're going to use the word Turing complete a lot. Uh, Turing completeness is just a way of saying that this can do what any processor top of the line processor or what uh, any computational model that humanity has thought of uh, can do. Uh, there are few, uh, there are quite a few less powerful models, say finite automata. They have only a finite amount of state, a finite amount of memory. A uh, Turing machine ha is supposed to have an infinite amount, uh, but you know, with the uh, sizes of RAM today, it's uh, uh, a fair approximation. So what we're going to show is that the machines uh, that we discover uh, are Turing complete. So you can compile any program and, uh, for them and run it on them and it will uh, happily execute. Uh, when you code an exploit, you also construct a machine. That machine is driven by your input. And you really don't care for that machine to be Turing complete so long as it drops shell. But it's convenient to say that uh, uh, it can do everything uh, that uh, it can do. After all, this is what uh, a root shell is about. You know, it's the uh, top level of power. And the slogan for today is that any input is a program. Think about it. When you have a sufficiently complex input, input format, message format, it behaves in practice, as you know, the exploiters here know, indistinguishably from bytecode that gets consumed by some part of the target and in the end uh, just drives the target through the computation that you care about, typically ending in root shell, but uh, you know, maybe you don't care about root shell, maybe you just want to corrupt this particular bit of memory or uh, leak this particular address. So, if your input is sufficiently complex, the receiving code is really just an interpreter for it. And let's um, make this a little bit more precise. So here is the Turing machine. The Turing machine consists of a finite state automaton, something that can look up a character on the tape, and there is endless tape on both sides, uh, simulating your RAM. And Changes state, think of this as this elevator kind of uh, thing. Uh, it only has so much uh, memory and state. Looks up that character, changes its state, goes through a transition, and then writes a character to the tape and maybe advances the tape uh, backward or forward. 
So what you have on the tape is both an input and a program. And in fact, uh, when you uh, write programs for Turing machines, which is the standard way of uh, proving equivalence of particular computing architectures, uh, that's what you do. You just say, OK, with this on the tape and these states, I can compute uh, uh, x and y. Now let's look at your uh, compiler's view of your code. And if you squint just right and imagine the uh, basic block structure, such as Ida would show you, uh, you uh, enter a basic block with some state of your variables, of your memory, and uh, you receive some input uh, from other places in memory, for example, or from I.O. You interact with the state, the state changes, and then you leave that basic block uh, across uh, a few transitions that are uh, defined for your program. But all of this is an illusion. The basic blocks do not actually exist you just imagine that they do, and the compiler imagines that they do. And the compiler thinks that the state only transforms so much uh, and applies optimizations based on that. Again, uh, this is not enforced. What happens when uh, you enter a basic block uh, sideways from uh, some other transition, or you receive some input that you don't expect? Well, the guarantees on what happens to your state are no longer true. The guarantee is that you will leave along one or more uh, fixed transitions are also no longer true. So your basic blocks are no longer there. You have quite a different distribution of how state can uh, be entered and how state uh, can be left and what can be in that state. Uh, this is important. You know this uh, for return-oriented programming, right? Uh, functions are uh, a fiction. You can enter a function somewhere uh, near the post amble, and uh, that's your ROP gadget. But this is a lot more general than ROP gadgets. And you have a lot more state on a real machine than the compiler knows, and you have a lot more transitions on uh, a real machine than the compiler knows. And so what happens there is that uh, if you really want to handle your input safely, you should take the view that the input is what drives the state changes in your machine, and it's the input that executes on your machine, same way as um, the Turing machine has input and the program indistinguishable from each other. They are one and the same thing. So, inputs execute on parsers. If you've ever exploited the memory corruption in the parser, that's exactly what it does, right? Uh, you have a crafted input, and uh, it affects the state uh, in the parser that it shouldn't affect. Uh, from that, you get an information flow. From that, you get a control flow that wasn't there. Packets execute on TCP IP stacks. Uh, that's a trickier thing, but again, think about it. Uh, bytes get consumed. State gets changed. Control uh, is uh, passed, so uh, transitions are taken. And the essence of your exploit is to extract those extra transitions and that extra state and drive the system into the state that you care about. Uh, heap managers, well, they execute uh, the metadata of the heap. Again, if you think about it, this is how you get the oh, four bytes overwrite in the uh, W linked list patch up of the classic uh, malloc exploitations and uh, many others. So today, we're going to show you two weirder examples. The first one will be that the metadata of your executable file executes on the dynamic linker loader, RTLD. And in fact, it can be as powerful as the Turing machine, that is to say your main processor. And the second one, which is even weirder and deeper down the stack, is that if you control the page tables, the global descriptor table, and the interrupt descriptor table on an x86, 
then you can actually drive a Turing complete computation without dispatching any instructions. Now think about this. All that silicon that goes into processing an instruction, all of that state is actually immaterial to this model. All you have is uh, the page fold handling logic uh, that uh, will drive uh, that through the uh, computation that you need. So any input is a program. And if you're thinking um, differently, when you're thinking Ponage. And um, with this, I feel that we're pursuing what computer science was meant to be with respect to actual computers. Early in computer science, Church and Turing explored the question of what is computable at all? Can you build a computer that will solve any mathematical formula? or any math well-posed mathematical problem. Uh, can you make a computer that does uh, this and that? Can you make oracles for uh, certain problems? And the answer turned out to be no. Computers can only do so much. And Church and Turing, each in their uh, own way, established those limits. Computers can do what is, what is computable is what a Turing machine can do. Uh, what hackers do, in our view, is that hackers write exploits exactly for the same uh, exploration of this possibility, of, this, uh, of those limits of the possible on a real system uh, that mathematicians prove theorem for. For what is an exploit if not a constructive proof that an unexpected computation is possible on this real machine? So this real machine, which you thought could not do it, can and therefore, you have discovered that you don't understand it. You have discovered a computational structure inside it that should, you should at least be aware of. And with that, we're going to our first example, which is the ABI uh, metadata machines. And we're going to talk ELF. Um, and I hand this off to Bex, who did all the work. Thank you, Sergey. So what my job, or what I, my goal is, is to give you a high level understanding of what components of the ELF and the runtime t that we used in order to harness and tame a weird machine. Um, and this work has been kind of inspired on a lot of past hacker research involving the ELF binary. Um, so we just kind of have this shout out to a lot of people, the Grug, Sylvia Mayhem, Eresi, which is what I, we built um, this tool on that it was able to harness the, the power of the metadata and low create by Skip, which is real inspiration for what we're doing in this particular piece of work. Uh, relocation entries were used as a way of unpacking binaries. Um, so for ELF, ELF is really just the executable and linking file format. Um, and that's really what it stands for minus the word final, file. And it, I like to think of it as the, the means in which the GCC tool chain and whatever tool chain you're using, compiler tool chain, communicates with each other and with the runtime. And it acts as a container for the code and the metadata that is needed in order to finally put this code into execution, including any libraries that are needed, any pieces of information that need to be patched once the load location is known. And ELF itself is used in Linux. It's used in a lot of places, other Unix varieties. The ELF relocation engine that we use um, is within the loading process. So when you think about how an executable is loaded, somewhere an exec call is made, an exec sys call with, you know, with the path that includes an executable. And the kernel comes in and maps the executable itself to some memory space, and then it looks and finds the interpreter, um, which is actually listed in the ELF file itself, and maps all of that. So usually the interpreter is the, the loader, uh, ld.so, um, and then it passes control over to the loader, which in turn starts this runtime load process, RTLD, which parses more through the metadata in the ELF because at least they knew not to do all the parsing in the kernel. Um, it goes more into detail to find what libraries are needed once you know it's running in user land at this point, and load all the needed libraries. 
So this is actually, this point in the runtime loader is where we found an interesting weird machine. And this weird machine is driven by the runtime loader and programmed by the relocation and symbol metadata within the ELF. So just to understand what, what structures, what, what, uh, what computation we're working with, this is more or less what the runtime loader relocation engine does. It figures out where the first relocation entry is. It reads it. Um, if there is a symbol that the relocation entry refers to, it will read that. And then it will calculate the value to patch and the location of where to patch. And it, it writes some, something to some, somewhere in memory. And it continues. And often there are relocation entries not only in the executable itself that it needs to process, but each library that the executable is dependent on. In, in the case of our weird machine, we use just the relocation entries in the executable and find that's actually a lot easier because executables, unless they're compiled to be um, position independent, they always like, get loaded to the same location. So it's actually quite straightforward, more or less, to, to really harness this weird machine since you know where all the metadata will live from the get-go. There are multiple primitives, um, I will call them computational primitives, that are used to start driving this weird machine. Um, and to get a sense of what they are, I have included what the definition of a relocation entry is uh, for ELF and what the definition of a symbol is because they're both used in this weird machine that we have running. Um, the relocation itself specifies an offset and that offset is the location that gets patched. If it's a library and the library is not loaded at the, uh, at the beginning of memory, then there will be often a base address added to the offset of the relocation entry, and that is the address that gets patched. Um, the relocation entry also specifies some info, including the type. Um, so the three types that we use for this weird machine are copy, um, one that uh, relative and one that's more standard um, where it just adds the value of symbol to the addend in the relocation entry and that's pretty standard. Um, and so for symbols, if a symbol is used that w you would know based on the info in the relocation entry and often the value is used, um, the symbol's value is used in the patching and sometimes the size is also used in the patching. So. Um, this is my interpretation of what these relocation entries do in terms of computation. Uh, so the cop one of type copy really just does a mem copy from, um, the, from whatever the, the, the symbol is pointing to, the number of bytes that the symbol refers to, and it copies it over to the address specified by the relocation mm -hmm. entry. And then the next type of relocation entry, 64 bit, um, it just copy, it just adds the addend, which is, is within the relocation entry structure to any base that there might be if it's offset somewhere, um, to the value of the symbol and writes that in the offset specified by the relocation entry. And the third type of relocation entry that we use in this machine is relative and it doesn't need any symbol, it just adds the addend, um, well, it's, it copies the addend to whatever offset is needed. So typically what happens when relocation entries are processed is the relocation entries themselves and the symbols are read as needed and sort of like an instruction to fetch. Um, computation is done and then data is written back and it's written back to the ELF metadata. It can be written back anything to anywhere that's readable but typically it's written back to other metadata. However, since we can write to anything that is writable and we have control over what is loaded as writable due to the headers in the ELF, um, we could start building a Turing complete relocation engine with the runtime loader just from writing back to any other metadata that's in there um, to the relocation. You can overwrite relocation entries, symbols, um, the, the, the dynamic loader information, and you can even look up the address of the stack, which I won't go into detail about, but you can clobber entries on the stack. So to really build this, en this machine, um, the relocation entries themselves are used to specify an offset to patch. 
And if you don't know where you want to patch at compile time, you can actually cal perhaps calculate in runtime and you know where these entries are. And you can use relocation entries to patch other relocation entries before their process in order to have this, this actual machine that is dependent on the runtime um, um, environment. And the symbol um, structures contain values that can be patched at runtime as well, because we also know where these are loaded. Um, and the symbols themselves and the relocation entries themselves directly contain values to write. So if you know, and you can do addition, right, with these relocation entries because they have an addend. So you can start saying, add this amount to this symbol value and write it over here. The relocation en um, engine itself uses some data on the heap and the stack to drive the relocation. So it will start searching for relocation entries to patch, and then it will figure out when to stop relocating by a value it writes on the stack. Um, we can actually overwrite this data to implement branching, can, um, and we can uh, use special symbols in direct functions to that um, give you a sort of conditional branch because they'll provide different values on which to patch depending on some other metadata in the symbol. So we can actually use relocation entries to copy some value you want to test to the symbol and then it will react differently depending on what, what is there. And that actually it can be used to implement conditional branching. And again, this is just a very high level thing. Um, I will show you where you can see the implementation um, if you want to get more information. So the, machine, the setup itself is that we use ERC to uh, make a copy of both the dynamic symbol table and the, relative, uh, the relocation entries that are, you, these are the two tables that are processed at, dynamically at, at runtime, uh, at load time, make a copy, inject new symbols at the end because the offset of the symbol table is actually important and you don't want to mess up what's there if you want the executable to still be able to run. Um, you can inject new relocation entries anywhere, but I chose at the top of the table so you can have your weird machine execute before the executable itself. And then update the other ELF metadata so this, it knows the new sizes, the new locations of the table, and finally write this new backdoored binary to the disk. So what can these weird machines do? Um, we've implemented a brain fuck to ELF metadata compiler, and the URL is up here, and you'll see it a couple times during the talk if you want to write it down. And so in theory, you can compute anything that's incomputable. Of course, there are restrictions on, on sizes of just because the field sizes in the relocation entries and the symbols are, are constrained, but we can run brain fuck on there. Um, also, this particular imp implementation is dependent on the glibc version. There aren't too many, um, and uh, we, we use uh, symbols, relocation entries and symbols for AMD64. Um, these entries can also traverse um, structures that the dynamic loader and linker use to locate libraries and locate information about libraries. Um, and so you can actually use relocation entries to look up where libc is at runtime if you have access to these relocation entries before it's executed. And of course, you can resolve symbols and addresses because that is what they are for. Um, but really, you can start patching other tables that the ELF uses in order to, um, to include libraries in order, and you can use that to just redirect code execution without actually making any changes to the native code sections within the ELF itself. And to show you an example, this is not a Turing complete, we don't use any of the Turing complete portions of this metadata language we built, but it's an interesting example where we actually hide a backdoor in a particular implementation of ping that I just randomly got from the Ubuntu source um, um, from INET util. So not the regular ping, but this particular example that I happened to pull has a particular uh, command line argument where you specify a type. And if you notice, there is a, a call to staircase comp with the string that you specified on the command line with some other things. So the, if we want to drop root shell because ping runs as root before it drops down to uh, regular user, um, we, 
want to see if we can get this particular function right here to call exec instead, because now we have control over what it executes. So we want to be able to do this without changing code. We also want to be able to prevent the call to drop root privileges but, um, before, so that we can actually get a root shell and not a regular shell. And finally, we wanted this to work in the presence of any sort of randomization. We can use relocation entries to look up where these libraries are and thus calculate where, the, knowing the offset of the function of exec, we can calculate that and patch it into the table that the linker and loader use um, to locate external functions. And it's fairly straightforward. In fact, nine, the, whatever is in green is actually the relocation entries that we injected in order to get this backdoor functionality. And the, the, the second table we see is a partial, t um, just the beginning of the symbol table. And all we do is set the value. And this value actually is just where this particular table is for function lookup. Um, I have a demo. We'll see. We just changed machines, so we'll see if I can get this running on this machine. It's a video um, because this is an ELF file and I'm running on a Mac. So I'm going to just show how we compile the backdoor in. It's not showing. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. Aha. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so here in this video first, we're just compiling, I have a tool that will look up the location of the functions we need in the library we specify and compile a new, the back door into ping. It's paused. Is it running? Ah, okay. It's running. So now we have um, something that's backdoored. And the next step, well, I'm just showing you that this particular argument that it supports that we are using. So the next step is to actually just set, make sure it's set UID because ping actually, this particular version of ping requires um, to run as root. So I show you that I'm in Deedbex and ping works normally if you don't specify the TR argument, um, the type argument, you get to ping normally and I'm still me. However, if you use this T argument, and I didn't show, but backdoor.sh is just a, um, a shell script that calls the, it calls the shell. That's all it does, and I, the reason we do that is because the weird way we call, use exec, um, we get some junk arguments sent, and you know, Bash doesn't know what to do with random crack that's thrown as a command line argument. But now we get a root shell just from patching these things via relocation entries. And to go back to the presentation, excellent. And so that's all you needed to do to change, and we only changed data. We didn't change any code. And next, I will give you Julian, who's going to, well. Yes, um, I'll take over for a second. <laughs> so, uh, professor's privilege. So let's reflect on what we've seen, right? Uh, you can use your data structure as assembly, assembly that resembles none of the native code, assembly that you would uh, normally take for just another piece of non-executable crap in uh, your uh, binary file. Turns out that your code that processes this metadata actually can be persuaded to arbitrarily rewrite memory, resolve symbols, work around the SLR, and replace any function calls uh, to any function calls as just the tiniest part of what it can do. And none of this requires any changes to any executable code in the uh, binary. So you've hidden an entire Turing machine, an entire computation in there. Now, uh, the uh, bit that Julian will show you uh, is a similar thing, except now, instead of programming with uh, those uh, C structs that your allocation section holds, we're programming with 
page tables, global descriptor table entries, interrupt descriptor table entries, and uh, a task segmentation uh, structure and task segmentation structures. And we call this the page fault liberation army because it liberates the power that uh, is in the processor for handling a page fault, which turns out to be again Turing complete on the input data. Uh, it really stands for page fault in linear address if you read the x86 manual. Uh, but uh, page fault liberation army uh, probably just sounds better. So um, this is uh, James Watt, for whom we name the uh, energy unit. Uh, he's been uh, berated very much in his childhood for idly uh, loafing around things that involved steam, like boiling kettles. You know, they tend to swing uh, because of the reactive pressure of the steam. And then, of course, he built this. And hopefully, we'll be able to, uh, you know, see people build something interesting out of this machine, or at least something that's one hell uh, of uh, an exercise to reverse engineer. Well, this picture here is for your enjoyment. <laughs> Page fault liberation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we were doing some unrelated work on the that involved using the x86, x86 virtual memory system. And I noticed how complicated it is. And at the same time, was listening to Bex doing her research on the awesome things you could do with the ELF metadata, which seemed, in comparison, to be relatively sane. So I thought, if she can build a Turing machine out of this relatively sane thing, there should be something we can drive out of this complete and utter insanity that is the, all the legacy features present in Intel x86 virtual memory. Normally, a textbook just says that, well, there's these page tables. They really do nothing but translate virtual addresses into physical addresses. It's just a lookup table. However, if you look closely enough, there is something more than a lookup table. In addition to having a rather complicated data structure that could resemble a lookup table, there is also some additional hidden state on top of that and some transitions. And in fact, the MMU that deals with these structures not only reads from the page tables and related structures, but through multiple layers of indirection, but it also can be made to write back into the very same memory. And if you make this output loop back into its own input, you get the same pattern that Bex discovered and can manage to build a Turing machine out of this. Normally, the view again is that interrupts and the virtual memory system is completely orthogonal to the actual execution of the program. But because everything lives in the same physical address space, if you're clever enough, you can just get, uh, use the hardware microcode that is already present in there to, get the com to, get that com to use that computational power inherent. The trick here, or the advantage here, is that you're not using any of the regular CPU instructions. So if someone tries to figure out what you're doing and reverse your code, they will probably have a disassembler there and will, no matter how much you obfuscate it, figure out what your actual program is doing. They might even have the fancy, expensive hardware set up so they can trace instructions as they're being dispatched. Well, if you limit your computation to only the MMU, no instruction will ever successfully complete. So no matter how fancy your, set, your setup is, if you hit single step, your entire program will still continue to execute before it ever finishes one instruction. And this is a general overview diagram we have of our conceptual idea that you have two separate sets of tables, the interrupt descriptor table and the global descriptor table that are the metadata driving the, compute, the interrupt handling logic and the page tables that drive the memory translation being fed into the MMU. The MMU, when encountering an error in this translation, tries to pass control to whatever operating system kernel you're running and as part of that writes some information to a stack. If now you overlap those three table structures, you can get, uh, you can use this to implement the Turing machine we're looking for. However, with this very high level overview, the actual evil in there turns out to be in making it work. And so I'll give a very quick and abbreviated overview of all the structures involved in this trapping and then proceed to show off a demo and give links to the tools so you can play around with this on your own. So Intel virtual memory translation is driven by a set of, pa by a set of page tables. In addition to being a lookup table of saying, 
uh, we have some physical or some virtual address here that we want to know where it is in actual RAM and split it up and use that as offsets into a two, by now it's evolved into four layers uh, table. There are also some additional permissions bits attached to it that tell the MMU what kind of access it's supposed to allow. If you're supposed to be able to read f uh, or to write to this memory, or if you're maybe also allowed to ex execute it, or if you need to read a kernel to touch this memory at all. If any of these conditions happen to be violated, the CPU tries to transfer execution to the operating system and tries to get the kernel to fix up the source of that error and or kill the offending process. As hackers have noticed before, this particular mechanism has, and because it's used so often, it's used twice per instruction usually, uh, first to fetch the instruction and then to fetch its data, there has to be, this is heavily performance optimized. So the naive version of just walking this table in memory all the time would completely kill all of the performance. So since the 386, in fact, this happens to be cached in special microcode uh, registers called the TLB. Uh, and there is no actual guarantee in hardware that these caches are synchronized with what is actually in memory. So if you cleverly desynchronize those, you can achieve unintended effects. This is how the PAX team in the uh, Linux kernel hardening patch simulated the non-executable memory bit which was added uh, much later by Intel into the hardware without changing the processor at all. Uh, and there have been other projects that have used the virtual memory system to implement some sort of sec uh, some security policy. For example, the Open Wall project used similar features to implement a non-executable stack. And the Olibone project has used it to debug complicated packed binaries. The way the microcode in the processor finds where the operating system or where it's supposed to transfer code from user space that might have just raised the page fault to the kernel is that it walks uh, a set of data structures used by the previous virtual memory system on Intel, the segmentation system, which is now largely disused. The segmentation system has a global table called the global descriptor table which can be pointed to either hold which in a particular interrupt handling mechanism we're using can be used to refer to so-called task state segments. This is a somewhat disused interrupt handling mechanism now. There is a much faster one which has less memory accesses, which is actually used by modern kernels, but the old features are still available in the processor. The task state segment is just a copy of almost the entire CPU state in virtual memory. And there are atomic instructions for loading and saving the entire CPU state at once. And there is another table called the interrupt descriptor table that tells you from what particular task state segment to read and load the state when you're trying to handle an interrupt. Afterwards, there is an additional push of usually just, in our case, just this error code with the other interrupt handling mechanisms, some further information onto a stack frame so the kernel knows what caused this particular page fault. Now the issue is if you have such a mechanism that makes it quite a few assumptions about the correctness of the various data structures. For example, if you're trying to push to the stack, there has to be a valid stack pointer. If any of these, if there are any issues in trying to handle that interrupt, there is a special interrupt called the, that is being raised called the double fault. Usually if you have a double fault in normal operation, your kernel just panics, and the only thing it does is dump core. However, it is perfectly valid and acceptable to continue execution after a double fault if you somehow return the CPU to a state of sanity. If you happen to have two double faults in a row, you get a triple fault and your CPU resets. Um, so in general, the very high level view of what happens when you have a page fault is that the CPU sta uh, saves the current execution state to the virtual address where it believes the task state segment to live, so it writes all of its state out to some location in memory, then finds the new state that it's supposed to load for the interrupt handler, validates that, loads it into memory, and then pushes an error code, thereby decrementing the stack. This alone turns out to be enough to implement a Turing machine. Uh, for time constraint reasons, I'll skip over the demo and just briefly point out how, the, how you can build that instruction from these primitives. Uh, while Bex went all the way and implemented an actually usable Turing machine that is just brain fuck and which is a programming language people, some very deranged people sometimes use, we went deep into the annals of useless mathematics and looked at the simplest Turing machine you could possibly build. You only require a single CPU instruction, that is decrement and branch of negative. 
Uh, in order to make it a bit more usable so we can actually write demos, we added a move on it. So our one CPU instruction is you just have two memory locations, X and Y. It copies Y to X. If X is less than four, you branch to instruction B. Otherwise, you decrement X by four and branch to instruction A. The, we always make sure that our instruction pointer, that we, we, while executing these instructions, we'll try to keep bouncing from page fault to double fault and back. While doing this, we'll always have the instruction pointer point into invalid memory, so we'll keep looping and repeating double faults and page faults. The variables that we have are stack pointers. So our arithmetic in the decrement by four is just pushing another uh, double word of error code onto the interrupt handler stack. The branch is implemented by that if the stack pointer happens to underflow on that particular push, it raises a double fault, whereas otherwise the entire interrupt transfer succeeds and it tries to fetch the first instruction of the interrupt handler, causing yet another page fault. Uh, and this allows us to run, to compile programs into such metadata describing the, uh, describing the virtual address space, which then allows us to, as soon as we jump into the first page fault, to execute any computation we want without uh, any native CPU instruction ever dispatching. So the initial state of this when we set up is that we have a relatively sane execution environment, except that maybe we just jump to an invalid instruction, which will cause a page fault to happen, uh, and the CPU will save all of its current state to this region in memory. And reload its state from uh, the task where it believes the interrupt to occur. As part of that, it also allows you to reload page tables. So all of these structures are addressed through virtual memory. By swapping out the page tables, you can cause all of this virtual memory to point to a different physical page, which is what actually gives us our move. We have one particular issue that we need to work around, which is that these Intel specifically tries to avoid the interrupt handling mechanism from looping over and over. So they added a special bit into the GDT descriptor to filter out if someone is running an endless loop of interrupts. However, because that bit is also stored in the same memory that the interrupt computation is driven by and can write to, we can overlap the data structures so that a valid descriptor for the interrupt handler without that busy bit set will be overwritten as part of going to the interrupt. So first the CPU sets this particular bit to make sure that it will not nest on this interrupt, but then it will immediately go back, write what it believes to be unrelated data, and clear that bit as part of that again. Uh, in addition, there are some further additional checks that try to make sure that uh, you preserve sanity while handling interrupts, which translate to us for some restrictions on how you can have these instructions flow. However, and it boils down into having some graph coloring problem on your instruction set. However, you can just insert some additional dummy, restrict, um, dummy instructions to deal with those particular issues. If you look at what is going on on the conceptual memory bus while this computation is executing, you see a much clearer picture that it's just writing uh, to what it believes to be stack pointers and reading to them while performing some computation. While this is not immediately an exploit because you need to have kernel access to set up, it results in a model of computation that is incredibly hard to reverse engineer and also might have some issues if you have a virtual machine that is not terribly, that is not implementing this terribly correctly. So as opposed, to have, while there have been many red pills that have been published, this is a red pill that actually allows you to compute, which at least for us has some academic interest. So I hope this was not all too rushed due to the unfortunate timing constraints because Macs suck. But uh, while, you while you pose some questions, I'll just run the demo in the background. I mean, I'm sorry because we're running out of time. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, how long it's going to take that demo? Pardon? Okay. Oh, I, I would say we j I just run the demo in the background while people ask questions, if there are any questions. Yeah, so we'll give you like two more minutes. Are there any questions? Oh, well, apparently not. And the demo is failing, so. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening, and excuse the technical difficulties.